Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Peripod. This week on episode 6 I am chatting to an absolute legend of the table tennis game. He is leukemia survivor, British champion, European champion, world champion, world number one, three time Paralympian, he's qualified for Tokyo 2020, he's also won the Paralympic Games, he has four Paralympic medals, He's a Strictly Come Dancing superstar. He's turned into a bit of a philanthropist now, raising money for Great Ormond Street. It is, of course, the one and only Will Bailey. So, hi, Will. How are you doing? Good, thanks, mate. How's, how's everything going with you? Yeah, it's going all right. It's, got, it's going all right, yeah. So, thanks for agreeing to do this. No, no, thank you, man. I've enjoyed, I have, as, as I was telling you, I've, I've enjoyed listening to them. And, uh, so, I'm excited to do mine right now. Oh, thanks very much. Right, so where are you? Because you've, you've got a seatbelt on, I can see a car seat in the back. Are you, you're you somewhere safe, yeah? <laughs> yeah, I've I've retreated to the car to do an in, to do this interview because uh, I tried to do it in the in the bedroom and it didn't work. Bella was just kept coming in, crying and stuff like that. So I thought, no, need to get in the car, a bit of privacy. And uh, <laughs> so, yeah, it's working. 7.45 <laughs> in the morning and the Bailey household is already in carnage. <laughs> oh, absolute carnage, mate, absolute carnage. <laughs> I'm holding on for dear life. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. So everyone, well, everyone that knows you knows how decorated an athlete you are. You know, you've won some amazing stuff throughout your career and you've gone on to do some great work um, outside of table tennis and things like that. But the whole idea of this conversation that we're doing on this episode is I want to get to know, or I want the people to get to know the Will Bailey that you don't really see. And if... Mm. If you're okay with that, I want to begin with your your childhood and what that was like growing up. Because me knowing you, I know that wasn't the easiest of times. But obviously, you were born with your disability. And if if you could, could you explain a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Yeah, um, I was born with uh, this disability called arthrogryphosis. Obviously, a lot of people might know it now because they might see me as strictly or whatever, and it affects all four limbs. So. Uh, effects on movement of all four limbs and also uh, the muscles in the body and how they develop some of the muscles around the shoulders and um, around the sort of the lower the lower legs so the, the sort of like um, yeah basically all four limbs um, but yeah I mean I had lots of operations when I was in Great Ormond Street when I was first born and then and then sort of like they they've sort of done a job where I can sort of do, do a lot of stuff now so they've done a, they've done a good job but yeah, it was it was up and down my childhood, especially like you know, like going to school and stuff was was tough when I had the Pedro boots on and stuff like that, or like when I you know when I was having operations and stuff. But um, I guess that's kind of made me the person that I am to, today as well. So so I wouldn't be without it if you know what I mean. Mm, yeah, absolutely. I totally understand that you said you know you wouldn't be the man you are without your disability, but so it affects all four limbs. How how does it affect you though? Like, what impact does it have on your daily life? Um, well, it's funny because it's like you, Martin. Like, I've, we've never known not to have a disability. So, I don't really know. What I, I mean, it obviously, you adapt so well. I mean, you, you're a great, um, you're an amazing, like, uh, example of being like, adapting to make it work. You know, I'm not just saying that, but adapting and making things look easy. You know, making things that some people are like, how do you do that look easy? And, I just I do that probably to a much lesser extent, but I guess you just you just make it happen, don't you? Just make it work for you, and and you uh, it's a bit like playing sport. You know, you have to find a way to to be effective, and it's like life. You know, you have to find a way to be effective, and um, and I, I guess I found that just through years of sort of trying different things and little little ways that my body works, and I do try and make the most out of what I've got. You know, I try and I tr I, tr I try and keep myself fit, and I try and eat well and I try and make the most of what my body's got to offer so I think that's important as well mm. yeah and, and you said it was tough in school um why was that tough? was that down to bullying or, or stuff like that um I'd say I'm not sure it's bullying I'd say like it was kind of questions like I found it difficult I think some some disabled people probably don't mind that but I was brought up with a I had an older brother and uh, my dad sort of left when I was about two years old, three years old, and so I didn't, I didn't really know. I was quite defensive as a kid going into school, and I was quite like, I, I was ready to sort of have a go. I'm quite, quite defensive now, 
Like so when I so when I go into like so I go into defensive mode sometimes. So when people are asking what's wrong with you at school, I was kind of like almost angry that they were asking. I, I took offence to it. You know, I was like, there's nothing because my mum sort of taught me that way. She said. There's nothing wrong with you, and if anyone says anything, there's anything wrong with you. You stick up for yourself and stuff like that. So maybe that was probably the wrong way of going about it. If I was to have another kid now, I'd say be a bit more open, you know, be a bit like able to talk about it. But I wasn't really able to talk about it. I guess it was kind of, I don't know, maybe I was quite brought up in quite an old-fashioned kind of way in that way. You know, it was it was kind of like swept under the carpet that I ever had a disability. So, so like when people laughed, it was almost like a surprise, if you know what I mean. It was like a surprise that people were seeing me as different. And uh, I found that difficult. But I had lots of friends at school. I mean, there was, there was times like when I had, when I had, we'll get onto it probably, when I had my chemo, and I lost all my hair. And like, that was tough. Because when you have to go into school and you've got no hair, like that, and, and, and like people, were, like last time they saw me, I had like full head of black hair. They were like, what's going on? Like, obviously, I got a lot of attention. I had a, a cap on and stuff. And, I remember one. I remember one day, one of the kids took my cap off in in the lesson, and like they were throwing it around the classroom, and I was like sat there and the, I was like sat there in the because they don't the kids don't know do they? So I was like just sat there in in the lesson without a cap on, my, my bald head like so. Yeah, it was it was up and down to be honest. Yeah, I think I think it's great as you said. Their kids a lot of the time don't know and they just no. sort of react to a situation and, and maybe not always in the best way, but, you know, I'm sure there was actually no malicious intent in that. It exactly. was just because you were different at the time and, and you know, this, that that as a child can single you out sometimes, you know, but I love that you kind of alluded on to it as you mentioned that you had chemo there. So there's obviously a story to come out of that. And so at what age were you diagnosed? I, I know that you had cancer at a very young age and, how was that experience? What was that diagnosis like? And do you remember that time very well? Or? Yeah, I remember it really well. I was, I was in the bath and then my mum was sort of in the bath, like washing me and stuff. And she she saw my, I was seven years old and she saw a, a lump on my neck and she said, have I been in a fight or has anyone punched you or anything? And I said, no. And then uh, the next day she took me to, uh, she took me to the doctors and she was like I'm not happy about this lump on on Will's neck and I remember it vividly the doctor said oh it's probably like a uh, you know it's probably nothing so she he gave me some sort of like antibiotics and stuff and, and then the very next day mum took me back to the doctors and she was like no I'm not happy about this and and then I went to to the hospital and from there I went uh, like I had two days of tests and then I was right I was rushed straight to Great Ormond Street because they found out I had like blood cancer so I mean it was kind of like a really weird time because it was like from and then I was on chemo like a few days later so it was like literally like from one thing I was being fine I was active to being in a hospital bed on chemo and I, I remember it really well and it's a strange one because you're seven years old so you kind of like don't know how how dangerous it is but you kind of know that it's not good and you know that and, and those thoughts stick with you you know it's a weird time because you're so influenced at that age you don't really realize and um, so those sort of thoughts still stick with me you know like those uh, sort of just the, the trauma of that it was quite for a seven-year-old it's quite traumatic you know to be in that sort of position and um so i think it's taken me time to get over it really and still it comes back when you're an adult it's weird how it sort of comes back when you're an adult, those traumatic times where I've never really had that problem before. But I think the last few years I've I found it quite tough because I've had a baby maybe. That's probably not that's probably not helped it. So when I so when you have a baby and stuff, you realise how precious kind of life is and you you can't imagine loving someone like that and then you think, Well, I had cancer. Imagine if my you know, you start to think, imagine if my daughter ever had that and you'd be like, Well, I don't know how my mum ever got through that time. Mm, well, that, that that's an incredible insight. You know, as you said, like you you've been on to have 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 a child, and then that's brought back these traumatic experiences for you because you know you start worrying about if she's going to be all right and if she's going to go through what you went through. And I think that's just that's just being a being a good parent. You know, of course you're going to worry and love about your children. And yeah, seven years old, like like of course that's going to throw up some traumatic memories because it's I mean getting cancer at no age at any age is not fun sorry you know and, and but to be 
a kid, like, and then you know, to be in the bath, and two days later, you're you're in a hospital, pretty much starting chemo. It must have been it must have been quite advanced um, when it was yeah. found, I assume. You know, and yeah. it was um, yeah. leukemia. You said, yeah, yeah. Wow, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. that that that's incredible. So how how important were the staff at Great Ormond Street then for you in that period of time? Oh yeah, the staff were amazing. I, I mean, I felt like I was at home. I felt like I didn't like I just felt part of the furniture when I was there. So I think that that's just they're so good. They're so dedicated and so talented. Like it's just uh, it's just such an important role as well. You know, to make someone feel safe and to make someone feel like they're going to be okay. And the nurses there are probably more, some of the best in the world on those on those wards. And you have to be very strong. I mean, I've been back so many times and, uh, you know, as an adult, and I, I find it quite tough to go back and, and to see everyone. To, so to work there, I can imagine it's, it's quite it's quite hard. You have to be a special kind of person. And they're, they're amazing. Yeah, I think we've definitely got to tip our caps there to, to the staff at Great Ormond Street. You know, as you know, first hand, they do incredible work. And, you know, they do it day in, day out. And they see some some kids just being the most resilient people in the world. And, mm. and that's fantastic. So, you know, we'll, we'll chat yeah. more about Great Ormond Street a little bit later. But I think, as you said, you know, it's such a pivotal time in your life. You know, you're, you're yeah. obviously born with arthrogryptophosis. You then, you know, going to have uh, leukemia and... and, and, and you're only seven years old. Like that's that's so much to deal with. And then you go back to school, and you said like folk are throwing around your your headscarf, and and yeah, like that that's tough. That's tough. It's tough. Yeah, it's, it's a strange one. I mean, it's a it's kind of it's kind of just uh, yeah. It made me the person I am, and if that's a good thing, it's a good thing. But I, I, I'm sure there's some negatives as well because of that, you know. So I think when people know sort of the things that I've gone through through my life, they probably see why I've got that kind of like um, mentality, you know, and, and kind of like I, I get obsessed with things and I'm a, you know, I, I have to win. I have to try and I have to give everything. And I think, uh, and I think I feel like I owe people, I, I owe myself that because I, I kind of like uh, sometimes some, you know, in some ways I shouldn't really be here. I'm very, very lucky to be here. And I feel like, I've really got to make the most of every moment and it and I feel like I'm letting people down if I don't you know I'm letting the doctors down to save me I'm letting um, you know everyone who fought for me and I, I've had that mentality probably because my mum's probably given it to me you know like you've got this chance now you need to take it you need to you need to go for it and, and take every moment you know take every chance and and um, I've tried tried to do that but it's, it is it is it is it is up and down. You know, it's, it's always challenging, like it is for everyone, in, uh, you know, in life. You know, so there's good things and there's bad things about having those sort of things go on in, in childhood. I think. Yeah, and I think you said you know it, it makes you want to never give up. And I think you know in battling what you battled is. I love that you got a cup of tea in the car. <laughs> Lovely um, life. <laughs> You know, as you said, you you battled so much at such a young age that it is no surprise to me that you have this never give up attitude because from such an early age, you you had no choice but to never give up. You know, so mm. what was what was the recovery process like? How long did the chemo take, and when did you get the all clear and things like that? Yeah, well, it was it was about a year of uh, treatment, um, um, and I I got the all clear. Of, I think it was a well it's actually five years like post uh like diagon post sort of like i think like after you've had your treatment they usually give it five years to give you the all clear because it could always come back there's like a likelihood that it could come back and stuff so i had five years and i remember i, I remember getting into a taxi and uh in london and i remember mum saying ask five years like since you've had since you had cancer and like that's a good, like, that's a, you know, that's a really good, and they're saying that it's unlikely that it will come back, and I remember just the feeling of, like, I was just so happy and relieved, and, and like, just, just my, I could see my mum was, like, nearly crying, she was so happy, and I, I just saw that, and I felt happy myself, so, I mean, yeah, it was, it, it, it was just a, an amazing feeling to overcome that, it, it really was. Yeah, that's incredible, especially, as you said, five years later, you'd have been, what, 11, 12, going on 13, yeah. maybe, and, so you definitely understand what's going on yeah. at that point and you know the severity of it. So yeah, the the feeling of just sheer elation and happiness, like I'm not surprised that was there at all. But yeah. There was there was a 
as far as I'm aware, there was a special person in your recovery period that um, did something pretty awesome that changed your life. And yeah. um, it revolves around a certain sport. <laughs> Can you talk yeah, about exactly. that? Yeah, well, um, like my, I was always, I, I love sports, you know, all sports. And uh, my grandma knew that and she, 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 really thought, you know, what sport can Will play without, like, having his Hickman line taken out. You know, I couldn't play any any sort of contact sports. Hickman line's like a line that you that you have drugs put into um, and it's basically connected to you. So you can't, like, obviously it could get taken out quite easily if someone, like, brushes past you and it can get ripped out. So obviously I couldn't do any contact sports. So table tennis was a great one. My grandma chose for me and, and I, I loved it. As soon as I picked up a bat, felt like tennis to me and I played tennis a bit before and and just a smaller version and yeah I loved it I played in hospital a bit with the, some of the people there and then I when I left I we got a table in the garage like a mini table tennis table in the garage as well and I started beating my brother at it so I thought oh, I thought oh, I love this game like I I can actually beat my brother he's three years older than me he's stronger than me bigger than me and I can beat him at a sport so I was quite happy with that so I, I wanted to carry it on yeah, I mean that's that that's incredible, and and knowing you and knowing your brother, I know how competitive you guys get. So I reckon oh, that God. that garage. Oh wow, my God! It? You've never seen anything like it. I mean, uh, I've never I've never seen someone so competitive as my brother. I mean, we've been on holiday before playing pool. And this was about three years ago in uh, in Spain, and uh, we had a we started off playing like this is, you know what it's like, just a bit of fun during a game of pool, yeah. It was like six frames all, and you should the tension. The tension was rid, ridiculous. And at the end of the game, I remember we actually touched noses. Like, like it got that stupid. Like, <laughs> we, were, we were like, I was, one of us was on the back, and I remember Tom just come up to me and he was like, he was like, why are you getting, why are you being like this? And then he literally came up to me and touched my nose, and he said, you know, if you want some. Like, and I, was just, I know it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. I know ex- yeah, I know exactly what it's like. I'm the same with yeah. my brothers, and it just, yeah, yeah, it gets, it never comes to anything. But I think that that competitiveness just drives you on, and you know, it's yeah. it's, it's it's the thing you can for 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 guys like yourself. It's so difficult just to have a friendly game of anything. Like I remember me and you, yeah. we, we've sat and played FIFA and stuff, and it's like. <laughs> Yeah, and I can't. And if I lose, if I lose to you at FIFA, I won't talk to you for about ten minutes. Yeah. It's weird, isn't it? Yeah. Like, I literally, I actually be annoyed. It's not like you can look at it and laugh now, but I actually go upstairs. I remember in Slovakia, like we were playing FIFA and stuff, and I lost to. I think it might have been you. I lost to someone on FIFA. I literally went upstairs and I was upset. <laughs> I was like, "What am I doing? Like, it's a game. It's a bit of fun." I was so so, so ridiculous. I actually, yeah. I actually remember that. Too. Now, I, the only reason I know that it was me is because yeah, I just love yeah. rubbing it. And and you, yeah. you actually came back downstairs and you had your bat in your hand and you were like, right, best of five. <laughs> oh god, <laughs> and, of, yeah, I and of course, I had no chance. Like I would have, oh, no, like no chance. Uh, uh, did you were like, yeah, best of five, let's go. We'll, we'll settle the score. And I was like, oh god, <laughs> I've lost the score. I mean, it's weird, isn't it? But but to be honest, I've heard about a lot of sportsmen and. A lot of people that play sport, uh, they've got that. I think it's just built in you. I think when you're competitive, when you played that long and you've been competitive your whole life, I think that's just built in you, isn't it? Sometimes, like the, the, even losing it, like top table. You know what I'm like. If, if we're playing top table and stuff, I start racing after balls if I'm like three one down, and I get really, yeah. really annoyed. And then I look at myself afterwards, going, "What am I? What am I doing? Like, what actually am I doing? Like, just stop, Will." But I can't help it. It's weird. Oh, bro. So when so you, you, you've had to say where you've got it in the garage, you've undoubtedly had many a battle with your brother whilst playing and training and getting get, getting used to the sport that you now love. And when did it when did it click that actually you know what this table tennis thing is is pretty cool. I'm having a lot of fun. Maybe I want to do something more with it. When did that yeah. happen? Well, I was playing at like a, a local club, Tam Tam Wells in, in Tam Wells, and uh, I was in, I was enjoying it then. But I wasn't. I was playing sort of like for fun, like just 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 to try and play. And I remember I, I started playing sort of like for the sort of junior county. I was kind of like in in around the Kent 
junior team, but it wasn't like great. It was kind of like just hobby hobby players, really. It wasn't great. But I remember seeing a guy called Joe Stokesbury in one of those days, and he's a Paralympian, and, and he came up to me and he said, oh, he, he goes, you, you could play in the Paralympic team maybe because you've got a disability. And I was like, I don't think I, I, don't think I do. You might have much of a disability. And, uh, and he goes, no, you definitely do. He goes, you can definitely play. And I said, oh, I don't know about that. And I remember... Um, I remember like going back to my mum going, oh, Joe, you know, this boy came up to me saying, I've got, I think, you know, he thinks I've got a disability and stuff. And I remember having those conversations and I was kind of like, my mum and dad were kind of like, well, no, I don't think you, you know, so it was weird. They were like, no, you don't, you don't. I was like, well, well I do because I can't open my hands and my feet are a bit weird. But I was kind of like, I get, I guess I appreciate their stance on it. It was kind of like they didn't want to see him. They didn't want me to see see me as like having a disability. Uh, I guess they just wanted to push me, you know. But but then uh, like a few months later, I saw Joe again, and I decided to go to a training camp, and I got absolutely battered by everyone at a training camp in in, in Sheffield. I, I was losing to all the wheelchair guys like Jamie and Arnie Chan and, and James Rawson and yeah you know, Scott Robertson who were playing at the time, and I was losing to all the standards, Dave Weatherall and Paul Caravaggio. Like, I got absolutely battered. And uh, and that's when I really wanted to play and really wanted, I got the bug for it because I was like, the competitive side came out and I wanted to be better. I wanted to improve and I wanted to compete with them. So, yeah, I guess, I guess, I guess that was the time where I switched on and I really wanted to be a, a good player. Mm. And and that, you know, that, that obviously experience of going to uh, a Sheffield training camp, you know, with the GB team, that kind of led you into going full time and throughout your education didn't it yeah yeah exactly i mean i went to i went to bristol academy first and when i was you know about eight, 17 eight, 18 i think 18 um and i literally like my i hadn't been playing properly i was just playing as you say as a, as a hobby player i'd say and uh, but then that, i started playing a lot like i was playing like obviously four four or five hours a day then so I really improved so fast and I was in class six and I, and uh, yeah, so, I mean, I started doing really well in the tournaments as well. So yeah, it was a kind of a, a rapid sort of rise um, from losing pretty much every game for uh, four or five tournaments. I played like Slovenia Open, I lost every single game and, and then I like, carried on a lot, I kept losing, I kept losing. And then after, a, you know, about a year of training in Bristol, I started winning. I was even winning some tournaments. I won the German Open, which was like, uh, amazing achievement i mean i beat a site i think i had a run where i beat like uh, kowalski who was world number six peter rosemar who's world number two and then daniel arnold who was world number one uh, in class six and then i was like uh, i was like wow that was literally just before beijing and so yeah it was a it was a it was a really quick rise to the top i mean it was yeah it was, it was great mm, yeah and you said you know if, if anyone that, that follows you or good, does a quick Google search to see that you are a class seven for Paralympic table tennis, but you touched on there that initially you were a class six. So what was that? What was that initial classification like for you? How did that go? Well, the initial classification was in Liverpool, and it was um, and I was I was sent to a tournament in Liverpool, and um, I was always told I was going to be a class six. So. I was like by Steve Ward, who was the coach at the time. He was like, "You're you're going to be a class six because you've got all four limbs affected. So, just um, just do what you need to do, and it, you know, just do what they tell you to do, and you'll be put in class six. And I was put in class six, so I just got on with it. As you know, you don't, at that at that time, and I was so inexperienced, I didn't really know what the classes were all about and stuff. Obviously, I, I knew to to an extent, but um, and then and then yeah, uh, I was in class six for a couple a couple of years, I think. And, until I got reclassified in, in the Europeans in 2000, in, in, in Crunch Vigor in 2007, I think it was. Mm, and that's obviously 2007, that's a massive part of the, the qualifying period for Beijing 2008. And you were on track to qualify in Class 6, weren't you? Yeah, I was just about on track. I mean, it was, it was, it was not easy, but I was, I was getting there and I, I was probably going to qualify as well. And I was quite hopeful for the Europeans as well. I was quite hopeful that I was going to be one of the Europeans. I remember arriving thinking I've got a chance here. So yeah, it was uh, it was a bit of it was such a weird time in my career. The lowest point I've ever been in my career by far, I think, was 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 that that week. It was a t- terrible week. 
and yeah. and at what period in that tournament did at the European Championships in Casablanca? When did they tell you that you were now actually removed from class section? Now going to be a class seven, and what did that feel like? Well, it's weird because I arrived at the hotel um, on the first day after travelling. You know, I was a bit tired, and I got a. a I got. I remember vividly. Steve came up to me and he goes, "You've got a meeting at uh, seven thirty in the night in the evening, and it's uh, about your classification. Nothing. Don't worry about it. It's just a, you know, it's just you know, regular thing." And I thought, "It's not the last thing I need." And uh, then went into a classification. Then I, I remember going to bed that night. They didn't say nothing, to, anything to me. Then the next day I went into another classification with like ten doctors it was like everyone was there and i was like wow this is mad this was like in the morning uh, and i was supposed to be training but i was taken out of training to do this and then and then that's when it all happened and i remember i remember that they put me outside for an hour i came back in yeah i came back in and there was like 10 doctors there and they sat around the table and they said we've come to the conclusion that you're class seven and Steve went, obviously Steve was very passionate and he went absolutely crazy. And then I, I, I just sat there and I actually started crying because I thought it was my career over at the time. Like I, I've looked up to these class seven guys, like like they're too strong and like I lose to Paul all the time. Like I was losing to Paul, like battered, getting battered a lot. And um, I was kind of like thinking, oh God, uh, you know, what am I going to do? So yeah, it was, it was a really weird time and I kind of argued my point a little bit, but it was their decision. I was reclassified. You have to pay to get reclassified. And Steve actually, yeah, bless him, he fought for me. And I, I got reclassified seven times during that tournament. So I was like, so when you can protest the decision, he reprocessed seven times. So every day for a week, I was in, I was in classification. So, wow. yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, it was really traumatic, actually, because, like, I was literally, every day I was getting stripped down, literally stripped down. Um, like naked basically and like they were put, like like you know, moving my joints seeing what I could do and yeah it was it was, a, it was a, a weird time especially because it was kind of borderline as well like even the classifiers were saying at the time um, that you know it, it was a t- it was a hard decision but then they were, but I think ob- I think it's changed a little bit since then I think classification's changed a bit since then um, which has made it a bit fairer and it's made it I think for me it's made me feel very much like a class seven. Whereas before, um, it was a bit different. You know, there was play, it was it was a totally different uh, classification, I felt. I felt there was a, a lot more able body players in class six. So it was kind of like a weird decision at the time. But now it makes sense because it's kind of equaled itself out, if you know what I mean. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's something that for para sport in particular, getting the right classification can either make or break your career in some yeah. cases. You know, as you said, when you got reclassified initially, you thought your career was over. Um, yeah. And I think from someone that's involved in the para setup, I totally understand that, you know, because yeah. being in the perceived right or wrong class can make a massive impact, not in terms of um, ability but just the physicality of it, you know, there's people that are just more mobile than yourself and things like that, and they can exploit you a little bit better in the higher classes. And, you know, so it's, yeah. it's, it's paramount to, to make sure that you're in the right classification to give you the best, you know, sporting chance from a level playing field. And and it's, you know, that, that must have been so difficult, as you said, seven times in one week, and you're trying to focus yeah. on competing and then you get classified and then go to another match and then get classified and go to another match and then get classified. Like, that's just, that's yeah. just incredible. But, I mean, yeah. it resulted in you becoming, you know, you, you know, you're a class seven and that's it. You know, it's, ne- it's never changed since. And mm-hmm. you, as a result of changing classes, didn't qualify for Beijing 2008. Um, you, you, you ended up being awarded the wild card. Um, mm-hmm. And... So what was that process like? Because obviously, you know, you knew that you weren't going to go to the games and then you, did you get a phone call? Did you get an email? Someone saying you got a wild card? How, how does that work? Yeah, I got a, I, I was, I, I knew the day that it got announced. Um, so I, I was kind of waiting by the phone and, uh, and um, I remember Dave actually messaged me and you've got the wild card and I, I didn't know for, for sure, but, I kind of like he wouldn't message me 
saying that unless I definitely did. So he must have been on IPTTC before me. And I, I remember just like so, so happy. I mean, I was, I mean, you know what it's like. I mean, I was desperate to go to games. And do you know what? It's probably the most important games I've been to. I, I didn't, I only won one match, but, um, and I played team and singles. But I mean, the, the being there for me was so important. I mean, I'm, I'm quite a, I'm quite, I'm a quite a late developer mentally in terms of like being there and being like ready for these big tournaments and stuff. And I needed to be in Beijing to do well in London 2012 in a strange way. It's like, it really did like set me up for, you know, being a big, big match player, having that, having that sort of like um, pressure in Beijing 2008, the noise, the, the, the theatre of it all. I was like, I wasn't used to it. And, and it definitely is. It definitely prepared me for like future tournaments. Yeah, and I think you know you, you kind of touched on it a little bit there, and it's very easy for an outsider um, looking in to just be like, oh well, it's just another tournament. But mm. you know, first-hand experience. You've been to three of them now. Yeah. It just yeah. isn't. No. You know, so as yeah. you said, it became a theatre. W- what do you mean by that? Well, I mean, I was so. I was so sort of delusional in a way. I, I I kind of just thought I'll put my music on, I'll walk out and I'll be fine. And like, and I thought, you know, I'm just going to focus on the table tennis and nothing's going to matter. I'll just be there. It's just me and the table. And I wasn't really open to thinking, what's the crowd going to be like? You know, am I, what's the noise going to be like? I had my headphones in for a start. So I walked out there. I had my headphones on full blast. I couldn't hear anything. And I took them off. And China, Yi, you know, um, Chao Kun Yi was playing next in the next door table to me and um, I took my headphones off. I remember the loudest roar I've heard ever. I mean, I've been in football stadiums, but I think because it was so close and intense and it was inside, I've never heard anything like it. Honestly, in Beijing, the noise was amazing and it was like, China, China. And it kind of like put the hairs on the back of my neck. They made them stand up and I, I kind of like got jittery. And I couldn't, and then I started knocking. I couldn't hear the ball on the table, and it was just to, everything was totally different. I wasn't ready for it. And it's like uh, the theatre; every single point you hear massive roars. So you're like about to go to serve, and you have this roar of like pure emotion from all the, all the fans. And I was like, I'm not used to that, you know. And and it, and it kind of like took me by surprise. So I think anyone who's going to first games or something, I think to be prepared for kind of like those differences and just expect them and it's normal to have those moments so it definitely I mean there's been times in my career where I've had massive massive points I think the final of semi-final of um, I remember the semi-final of Rio, of, uh, Rio 2016 I was playing Jordi Morales it was in Juice in the fourth and uh, Israel Stroff just won, a, won his match and the noise in the stadium I had to actually pause for 10-15 seconds because I literally couldn't serve like because of the noise, like it was just so so noisy, and and um, and I think those sort of experiences they help for those moments, you know, for the moments you really need them, for when you actually really need them in those big moments, uh, you get a bit more composure and stuff because you're kind of expecting it. So yeah, it's definitely helped me being in Beijing 2008. Yeah, wow, what an, what an incredible insight! And you said you know you needed you needed Beijing 2008 to do what you did in London 2012, you know, your next Paralympic Games. By this point, you were, you were, what, two in the world? Three in the world? Were you as yeah, high I as that? I think I was two. Yeah, I think I was yeah. two. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, so you've, you've, you know, definitely secured your spot at London. It's a home games. Yeah. Just, just, just being there at a home games, what did that mean to you? Because it's, it's in London, you know, as well. Like, it's your cool, home. Yeah. That's your home, you know, so... What was yeah, that well, like? Well, it was just, it was amazing to, to be a part of it. I mean, it sounds boring, but it, it was. It was special. It was unique and felt like an out-of-body experience at times. I loved it. I loved being a, I loved being part of the team. I'm not sure I enjoyed it that much because, in, like, if, if that makes sense, I loved, the, I loved the experience and wearing the kit. And, like, I felt like a million dollars and I felt like, oh, amazing, I'm playing in front of... But I'm not sure I enjoyed it, enjoyed the moment because... I was so desperate to do well, and I was ner- I was nervous. I was I was nervous when I was playing. I, I was all right. I was I was quite confident because I trained so so hard. But I was I was nervous, like you know, in, in the village. I wasn't sure I was enjoying it and stuff like that. So it was it was a it was a, probably what what most athletes feel for that 
for that sort of home games. And I knew I had a big expectation on myself. I knew I wanted to go and win. I wanted to win, you know. So it was a, it was a, it was an up and down kind of, kind of uh, event. But it was so special to be a part of it. Mm, yeah, I, I can imagine. And, and you got all the way to this final of of, of London 2012, and you come up against yeah. another Class Seven Paralympic legend, Jochen yeah. Vollmer. You know, and um, he is just he's such a decorated athlete. He's won yeah. everything there is to win. And but you know you've You've got the crowd on your back and support. You know you're in London. It's the home city. You're the local boy. Um, there must have been so much pressure for you walking out to that final. You know, compared to every other match, it must yeah. have been so much more than a final. You know, because you've got thousands and thousands of people just needing you to win. And like, what was the pressure like walking out? Um, do you know what? It, it's just a really weird one. Like. I actually felt less pressure in the final than the semi-final. I played Nikolenko in the semi-final. I was so nervous because Nikolenko was so dangerous. He was playing really well and um, and I knew I had to play really, really, really well. I was probably not favourite in that match. I lost to him like three times before um, and I was kind of not favourite at the time. And I was kind of so nervous. And then the final, I, I, re I remember winning the semi-final and, you know, we were young and, you know, you get on the bus and people are going to you, but you, you know, you've got this. Like all, all the teammates, all the guys, you know, in the squad, you know, you know, then we got onto the bus and they go, you've won the, you won, you won the Paralympic Games. And I remember, I remember thinking, oh, I've, I think I have as well. Like, I, I can't, <laughs> you know, you know, you do, don't you? I think, oh, God, I've won this. Like, and then, phew, it was a weird, weird, weird game. I mean, I, I remember seeing Jochen and, I remember, I, I remember seeing him thinking he can't beat me. Like, there's nothing. Like, I was so confident. And Jochen was so chilled as well. Like, Jochen was so chilled and I was so pumped up. I was so pumped. I was ready to go. I was like, I remember, I remember like shouting before the, in, in the call area, like, come on, let's go. We we're like trying to G myself up and Jochen was just smiling. And I remember thinking, this is weird. This is really weird. And then, like we got to the table and Jochen was like still smiling and he was still like really <laughs> chilled out and it was really pissing me off. I was like, why isn't he pumped up here? Like, why am I so pumped up? And it started and suddenly it's like the game just, like, just kept got moving moving further away from me. By the second he was in control of everything, he just controlled everything in that match. And I never felt like I had any control. And I guess that's why he, he well, he was so experienced, but he that's why the player he is, he can sort of, up it for those, for those ma major tournaments and for those big occasions, and everyone tries a little bit harder. But Jochen has a way of just like being himself, and I learned so much from him in that match. Like I I've looked at that match quite a few times, and that's what makes a great player. You know, not someone who has to do a bit extra when they go to a big tournament, but just someone who does what they do day in day out. And he just did that. I was trying to be Will plus you know, plus five or whatever. And it then, you know, it's not going to cut it when you're playing someone so clever and so chilled out. And it was really weird. It was, it was a really great learning experience though. I don't know what you think. Sometimes I think you can try too hard when you go to those moments. And, you yeah, know. you definitely can try too hard. And I think that's a great message to share to, to athletes that are up and coming. And, and, you know, hopefully some younger viewers and listeners is that, you know, when you get into these pressure situations, whether it is, sport or life or whatever it may be is as you said just be yourself you know don't mm. try and do anything above and beyond and and be super duper spectacular it's actually just be be who you are and you know because that's what's got you to that position and you know that's what needs to come out is just yourself not anything that's not you and you know for you to have the awareness and the maturity to understand that you know as you said you learned so much as we often do in life you learn so much from losing yeah. You know, that, that setback of, you know, getting to our home games, you get to the final hometown hero and getting so close to, to in the end, actually losing a match. And as you said just there, you've learned so much from that. And that's such a key message that I think people will take away from this. And, you know, one of the one of the great scenes that, you know, if you watch any highlights of London 2012 is obviously uh, Jochen wins the match. But the first thing he does is come up and give you a hug. You know, because yeah, yeah, as you said, he's such a he's such an experienced athlete. He knows mm -hmm. the pain that you're in. You're at a mm -hmm. home Paralympic Games, 
and you've just lost in the final. He knew you'd be hurting. And um, it's one we'll, we'll get to it later, but you pretty much did the same four years later to someone else. You know, you yeah. were in that position where you beat the homeboy and, and, and you gave him a hug after the match and things yeah. like that. And it's, it's, that's so much more than a handshake. You know, it's, yeah, exactly. um, it's, it's that actually, you know what, I understand your pain and, and, you know, I'm sorry, but I had to win. And, yeah. uh, and, and, and that's, that's amazing. But after, after London 2012, you went on just, just from strength to strength, you know, um, yeah. Not that it get it doesn't get much bigger than a Paralympic final, but you know you went on yeah. to become European champion, um, yeah. which is which is incredible. And then twenty fifteen, you you went to China again yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> for yeah. for for the That's world cool. championships and uh, my, my our, best ever tournament. My best ever tournament, yeah, for sure. What, why why was that? Um. I just, I just had everything in that tournament that I wanted. I mean, I remember, I, I remember playing with Kim the day before the tournament. Kim, and like Kim's quite like you wouldn't say Kim's your teammate, obviously. For those who don't know, Kim's not the kind of guy that would come up to me and sort of give me confidence. You know, if he didn't feel feel it, you know what I mean. He would, he never says too much to me in terms of you're playing well or anything like that. He kind of just like lets me get on with it. But he came up to me and he goes. He, he was just like you're you're really you're really really on fire and he's like you need to take you like this is this is your time i think to, to take this and i and that was really nice of him because i kind of like gained even more confidence when he said that to me you know i just played him in like a match just like and i, I remember people watching it like i remember like in, in training we're, we're just having a sort of sparring match and i remember some people watching it like going wow like these two are playing well and I was like gaining confidence and you know what it's like, you know, when you're having a knock and you're just playing really well. And I and then the first game on, guess what I had you up in Walmart, I think it was in the first game. I lost the first set and uh, suddenly you're like, oh, God, and I was 4-1 down or something in the second set. And I was like, this is, everyone's going to be saying, oh, I've absolutely flopped. And luckily I came through that and, um, and, uh, and and it, I just had a great run after that. I gained a lot of confidence and played Popov, I think, in the semi-final. I, I, I remember, this is a funny story, though. Um, I don't know, not a lot of people know, but I played the quarter-final match and went went to bed that night. Me and Paul went for dinner downstairs in, in, in this, in this Ch Chinese restaurant, obviously, and came back up and I started being sick and I wasn't sure if it was nerves because I was just about to play the semi-final against Popov the next day at 9 o'clock in the morning. I was being sick so much and it was like 10 o'clock at night and I remember knocking on Tim Tim Pitt's door who was a psychologist and I was like, Tim, I, I, I keep being sick, I'm not sure if it's food poisoning or if I'm just nervous and he came into the room and, uh, and I started and he goes, oh, I, go, I think it's the fish I've been eating. I remember Paul Carolina coming in and he goes, yeah, the fish was to die for and I would say it was absolutely beautiful. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, don't sit down, down the toilet. Uh, but then, I, yeah, but then, I, yeah. Luckily, I came up the next day and played pop off and beat him three one, and it was a close match. And then had a great final against Nikolenko, which was brilliant in that. And I think we both played well. Nikolenko still says to me now that that was probably one of the best matches he's played as well. So I mean, uh, it, was, it was a good, it was a good game. Yeah, it, it was a fantastic game. And and for those that haven't seen it, you know, just go on YouTube, search Will Bailey World Championships 2015 final um or something similar i'm sure it'll pop up it was an amazing match yeah. and it was just back and forth it was an absolute like yeah. slugfest you guys were just going after hammer and tongs and um yeah. you know the, the the final point uh just, just the sheer elation and, and relief from from yourself and the outburst you know you 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 yeah. tried ripping your shirt off and everything, and <laughs> oh, such a bad celebration. <laughs> it was, it was, oh, it was amazing. Um, you eventually yeah. got it off, just, just about, um, just about, yeah. It was the, that passion, you know, just for, for, for the game and 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 for for being competitive that shone through, and it was it, it was awesome. And you ended up going on to the next Paralympic Games uh, the following year at, at, at Rio, and. You know, as you said, um, you 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 played Jochen in the first match of 
uh, the World Championships and lost the first set. You played the homeboy, mm. uh, Israel Stroff, in Brazil at Rio 2016 in your first match and lost the match, not just the set, yeah. you know. So that must have been a major setback and a major sort of like wake-up call because you've just gone from being world champion to losing the first group match in a Paralympic Games where you're number one seed. Like, what was yeah. going through your mind at that point? Oh, my stress. I'm um, so much stress. I was so upset and... I remember feeling like I've had the you you felt like it, every place felt like it, like you've had like emptied, you've been emptied, you've been kicked so many times and you've got nothing left. And I felt like that at the end of the, the first match in the Paralympic Games. I just felt I felt like my tournament was over. I felt like at that moment I felt like it was gone and you know, credit to Big G Goras because uh, he said like when you leave this, don't don't when you leave this stadium, don't leave with your head down, leave with your head up. Um, and 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 make sure you let people know that you're still in this tournament. And I and I uh, and I listened to it, and I I kind of like just put my head up, and I like started clapping the the audience, you know, and and I kind of like they clapped me back, and I kind of like um, kind of like left with my head held high, and then I went into the, like this. Uh, we went through the sort of you know you have to do the media and stuff. And then Gorad's like literally chucked me in this cor in this like room that I've never been in. Like it was like a like a storage room, and we sat in the storage room for like half an hour. And me and Gorad's and I was just sat there. I wasn't talking to him. And Gorad was just talking to me, and he was just saying, "We're not out of this. You know, you can be Kelly Liao tomorrow, and we can go through. Two goes through the group, so you've got a great chance." And and um, yeah, I mean, it was a, it was a incredible few hours I played Kelly Liao the next day at nine o'clock so I mean you can imagine the roller coaster of emotions going on um, you can imagine that you, you know what table tennis was like I had to win that game 3-0 uh, to make sure I was going to qualify because of the count back I lost three mm -hmm. run in, in, my, in my first game and Kelly Liao beat Israel Stroff so I mean there was a lot of stress going on in my in my head you know and I managed to pull that off probably one of my best wins because to win 3-1 against anyone in the Paralympics. Sorry, 3-0 against anyone in the Paralympics isn't easy, you know? Mm. So I was really, uh, yeah, it's just great to cut, pull through that one. Yeah, and then you went on a bit of a run and, you know, mm. no surprise, you're, you're back in another Paralympic final. Um, mm. And lo and behold, it's Israel Straw, the homeboy <laughs> that you had in the group. Um, yeah. And how does that pan out? What are you thinking there? Because he's, you know, you've played once this tournament, and he's one for one, you know. Um, so what's what's going through your mind getting into this final? I had a really, I had a lot of confidence because um, I just felt that I could win. I just felt like I, I felt like I had the tools to win against anyone at the time, and I still do really. But I mean, like I felt like on my day I could beat anyone, and if I did the right things, and I felt like I, I, I had a lot to prove. Sometimes when you lose to someone, you're you're quite dangerous because you've got a point to prove. And I felt like I had a point to prove. I felt like I could do a lot to him that I didn't do in the first match. So I was kind of just focused on the tactics. And that's another thing that I wasn't thinking about the motions of a game like I was in London 2012. I was just thinking, you know, just get out there and fight. And I wasn't thinking like that. I was thinking, well, what can I do actually to, to win and make life difficult for him? And that was a better way of thinking. And yeah, I managed to pull through. It wasn't a brilliant performance. It was really bitty. I mean, I remember speaking to him in the warm-up area going... Um, and he, he said to me, you know, I was foul served quite a lot in the tournament. And I said to him, listen, if, if you don't call my serves, I won't call your serves. And he said, no. <laughs> he said, he said, he said, no, I, I won't call your serves. So we'll just have a good match. And uh, that was the first, that was the, that was the comment. And then um, first serve I do straight up to the umpire. <laughs> straight up to the umpire. And, and I was just like, "What is this?" So yeah, and then and then it gets like that, doesn't it? So I mean, I mean, it was a great match, and it was uh, it wasn't a great match technically, but but sort of like for the theatre of stuff, it was it was good, and yeah, just to achieve an ultimate dream of mine, I never forget that moment. Um, I put in a lot of work, so it was it was definitely worth it. It was definitely like worth all those heartbreaking moments I've had in my career, and I sort of flooded back memories in my childhood and stuff when I won that won that match. Yeah, it was incredible. And then, you know, you, you ended up 
getting a yellow card for your celebration. You jumped on top of the table, standing on top of the table, and there's still matches to be played on that table. You probably yeah. read it off. <laughs> yeah, I know. I was thinking that. I was surprised I got on there. I definitely wouldn't be able to get on there now at the moment. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, it, was, uh, it got up to the table, so that was a good thing. I mean, you, you, you totally deserve it, you know, being Paralympic champion and, and world number one, European champion, world champion, pick a tournament, you're the champion. Um, <laughs> you know, you, you, you've won everything. And, and that led you to um, a little bit of somewhat of a celebrity status. And you end up, you end up on Strictly Come Dancing. Yeah, I know. It's That's incredible. Yeah, well, it's a, it's, a, it's, a weird, it's a strange one. I mean, do you know what? I probably would never have got on there if I wouldn't have celebrated like I did because um, it was uh, the, the the producer at the time, um, which was like two years before I went on, she, she was the first one to get in contact with me because her son was watching celebrations on YouTube and, must have, and saw, my, saw my celebration and she showed her mum, the Strictly producer, and said, Mum, have you seen this guy jumping on the table? And she was like, no. And then she wanted to find out more about me, so she obviously researched me, she told me. And then she called me up and she said, have you ever thought about uh, going on a dance show? And I was like, no. And she was like, oh, I'm the producer of Strictly and we want to see you, you know, you should come to an audition kind of thing, you know, and give it a go. And, uh, yeah, the rest is history, really. I went and I loved it. I was actually with Jeanette in that, in that little um, sort of audition hour, sort of long audition we did. And... Yeah, I really enjoyed it, and it was a, I mean, the whole thing was surreal, totally surreal. But it's a good experience. Good to see how the other sort of, you know, other people live and the celebrity lifestyle, and that's so though that was a good, it was a good experience. And I realised, I realised what was important to me as well during that time as well, and how important table tennis was to me, and how how much I missed playing, and how much what motivates me as well. Like, is it is it the sort of the fame, and is it the wanting to be famous is it the money or is it just wanting to win medals and wanting to win trophies and i realized it's just wanting to win win medals and winning win trophies that's what motivates me more than anything and that's what i have to just stay true to my heart and what i really love doing and it's winning and playing table tennis so i mean it, it taught me a lot in that way because i was kind of in that moment where i, was, I wasn't sure what i wanted to do i was like you know do i go and try and make it in sort of that that world or do I kind of like just you know just be a table tennis player and I guess you take it for granted because you've been playing so long you just think oh you know you just you just play the circuit don't you and you you don't realize how amazing it is how amazing the opportunity is that you've got you know to play table tennis you know every day you, you get to go to different places you get to go around the world and tour the world and play table tennis and you take you take it for granted, and then you see you see like the life on the other side, the celebrity lifestyle. And I was thinking, well, I don't know if I, I don't, you know, this is more for me. You know, just being a table tennis player, I'm at the peak of my career, I can win so much more. So yeah, I think it just it was really important for that. You know, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I I totally agree. You know, sometimes you have to branch out and try new things. But as you said, yeah. ultimately, you know, you you. you you reassured yourself that actually you're, you're on the right path. You're doing what's good for you. And, and, and what defines Will Bailey is, you know, that hunger and that competitive and that resilience and, mm. and that's resulted in a love for the game. And it's great that you said, you know, you've, you've went out and sort of sampled life as it were, and you've came back and actually, you know what, you, you, you know, what's good for you. And, and that's, you know, that's, that's a great message to share is actually understanding yourself mm. so well, but obviously, um, Towards the end of Strictly, you suffered an injury, yeah. uh, and you know you, you you tore your ACL or snapped it, and um, you know as as they say, accidents happen. It was a complete accident, um, yeah. but it's it's led you onto this road of recovery. And I know um, from chatting to you and and um, from obviously your social media and stuff, you finally started to hit a ball again, and yeah. started to train a little bit. You know, after almost a year out. Uh, from yeah. not being able to do anything other than rehab and and you know get treatment and stuff like that so what was it like you know setting out for almost a year doing absolutely everything yeah. bar training what was that like well, it was tough it's it was definitely the toughest time of my of my sort of playing professional career i think i mean i'm always again taking things for granted just being fit being able to play 
Uh, being able to move without pain and stuff like that, take you know, without severe pain, I've been I've taken that for granted. And when you have an injury like that, I mean, you can't move properly. Like you can't, you, you know, you can't sit in a car properly, stuff like that for months. So I've kind of, yeah, I, I kind of like just just to be just to be back and taking every day as it comes and to be like back sort of playing to, to, to sort of some level. I've still got a lot to, a lot, probably about three months to really go till I'm fully, fully fit or even four months till I'm fully fit. But I'm getting there and uh, I mean, I mean, I'm enjoying hitting a ball again. It feels great to be able to just hit a ball and to be able to train and to be able to practice and definitely motivated to, to, to go on and to try and get over this injury and to try and um, to try and be better than I was before not just as good and just want to evolve as a player and to try and be better and try and be stronger and, and work on those things that I've never worked on before and I, th- I think when you get an injury you do work on things like you work on your mental game you work on your you work on those little weaknesses in your body that you want to get stronger so hopefully you know I'll, I'll become stronger because of it yeah and I mean knowing knowing you and knowing how mentally tough and resilient you are. I have no doubts in my mind that you are gonna, gonna, you're gonna bounce back from this and just go on from strength to strength. You know, I, I don't doubt that okay. for a second. And um, obviously, the next thing on your horizon is, you know, fourth, fourth Paralympic Games. That's yeah. like yeah, veteran, so, veteran. People, you know, you know that that that's incredible. That's incredible. Yeah. And you know, no, knowing you, I'm sure you'll get a fifth in Paris. But you know. It, Fourth yeah. Paralympic Games, you know, just to get to one uh, is an incredible achievement. Yeah. It's your thing. Yeah. Just, just, just get to get to one's an incredible achievement. You then go on to get a silver medal. You then go on to get a gold medal. Are they going to invent some sort of new platinum medal for yourself or, or well, something like nice. that? It'll be you know, nice. it's, um, it's, 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 it's incredible, Will. And, you know, I'm sure you're going to have sort of smash Tokyo next year, um, you know, when the, hopefully the world can get back to the new normal yeah. as they're saying and um yeah and things like that but you've you've had such a decorated wonderful career you know you've got an incredible beautiful little girl who has obviously changed your life immensely and that's something else to fight for when you're mm-hmm. when you're out there in japan and you know you've now got this new this new comeback story of, of the resilience and the injury and, and, and things like that and mm-hmm. it's just it's an incredible story and we've, we've only been chatting for i think just shy of an hour and it still yeah. feels like it's been a whirlwind tour of the Will Bailey yeah. story. You know, you've got so much to share and so much insight. Um, but I don't want to keep you too long because I know you're a busy guy. But it just coming towards the end of of this episode, I would just mm-hmm. I, I want to take this opportunity to say you know thanks for coming on. But also I want to give you the opportunity to thank those that have supported you. You know your sponsors and things like that, and, yeah. and those nearest and dearest. So. By all means, use this as a shameless plug and give yeah, them definitely. a shout out and just to say thank you before we touch on the final subject. Well, yeah, first of all, thank you to to my teammates, as you know, because I wouldn't be the player I am without my teammates. And it sounds cheesy, but you know they have to practice with me, they have to be with me day in day out in the training hall, and I need you next year. So I need you all next year to be good, as good as you can be, and to be as positive as you can be, because otherwise we won't win medals. So. First of all, they're the most important, my teammates and then coaches, the support staff around that um, and my and, uh, my family, obviously, they're obviously the most important. But And uh, and then my, my sponsors, Weights Group and uh, Atrium, thank you for the support. Everyone out there who sent me supportive messages, thank you very much. But yeah, it's just the, the start of this brilliant team. It's brilliant. It's a privilege to be part of this team and I'm just a small part of it, but I'm, I'm enjoying being a small part of it. And, I want to see everyone be successful in Tokyo and I think and beyond and France and I think we've got a great exciting young team so it's just really it's really cool to be a part of it mm, Yeah bro as you said obviously you've got private sponsors there Weights Group and Atrium who I know have supported you you know uh, at an incredible level but what about yeah. uh, table tennis do you have any table tennis sponsors or anything like that? Yeah and that, oh, yeah, great great shout Martin yeah uh, T-Sport as well I've been very very supportive actually I've got them there. I've got them there, so I haven't let them down. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. T Sport have been very supportive, wearing their t-shirt. So, yeah, it's uh, they, they've obviously given me a lot of um, equipment, and uh, yeah, Dignix 09 C I'm starting to use now. So, we'll see how that goes. Mm, brilliant, brilliant. No, and um, just, just, just before we go, um, 
for those that have been following your story on social media and stuff, you are running a uh, incredible. Uh, you've be, you've basically become a philanthropist. You know, you're you're helping <laughs> loads of people um, around around the country, but in particular at Great Ormond Street. And just just sort of as your sign off message, um, I want you to just plug your face mask because you've gone on to raise tens of thousands of pounds for Great Ormond Street, a charity that means so much to you. And uh, can you just, before we go, just quickly talk about the face mask yeah, and, then, and then you can have the rest of your day. You're good to go. <laughs> yeah, cheers, mate. Yeah, no, everyone, um, you know, you have to wear a face mask now out in public. So if you can buy one, this this mask is, is the one to get because um, so it's the Will Bailey Rainbow Face Mask. Just Google it and uh, everything that, we, that we're making out of the face mask, obviously going to Great Ormond Street Hospital, helping the children there and getting them things like, extra things that they need in the, in the hospitals like computers can make a massive difference to games, stuff like that, um, even the entertainment. So, you know, you know, please get the face mask. It's going to, you know, you're going to need one. So if you can get one, please get the Will Bailey one because it will make a difference to so many children's lives. And I really appreciate it, you know? Yeah. yeah. So that's all I can say, really. Bro, do you know, do you know roughly how much you've raised so far for Great Ormond Street? Yeah, it's about thirty thousand now. So we're just moving forward, and we're trying to get up to fifty. Is our it was our target at the start, and we're just still trying to sell as many. And now, because everyone's having to wear face masks, the sales are going up again. So we're still trying to sell. That's fantastic. So that's going to be the sharing message when all this goes out. Is this, let's get fifty thousand pounds for Great Ormond Street. Um, yeah. You're on track at thirty at the moment. That's that's absolutely incredible. You should be so so proud of yourself and the team that you've got that's around it, you to create this. Um, thank you for taking this time out of your day. I know how incredibly busy you are with, you know, all your stuff that you got on, and, and obviously the little one at, at home as well. So I really appreciate you taking the time, um, and just yeah, thanks very much. Hopefully, get to see you soon. We can have a coffee and uh, and hopefully yeah. get back to training sometime soon. That would be awesome. But yeah. until then, thanks again. Enjoy the rest of your day and have a good one, mate. Thanks, Mark. Much much respect. See you soon, mate. Bye, bye, bye. Cheers, mate. Bye, bye. And that brings to an end another episode of Peripod. What an incredible guest as well. He's got such a phenomenal story to share. Please support him on his journey to Tokyo 2020. I'm sure he's going to take another medal. And you can do that on Will Bailey TT on all social media platforms. Also, let's make sure we get behind his Great Ormond Street face mask. Let's make sure we get that target that Will's now set of £50,000 for Great Ormond Street. He knows firsthand that this money goes to children that really need it and it'll change their lives and change the family's lives and it'll do so much good. So please, please, please get behind the Will Bailey face mask, get behind Great Ormond Street, give the money to where it needs to go and of course, don't forget to like, subscribe, share the podcast on all platforms. Let's spread the word. Thank you.